And now for the topic of the hour. I consider it a pleasure to work with Dick Sloan, assisting him in his on-farm research endeavors with PFI. Dick always kindly and patiently answers my questions about farming. Both of our speakers today are a fount of knowledge and wisdom. I consider myself lucky to be in the wonderful company of a great farmer, Dick Sloan, and a great scholar, Iowa State University professor, Dr. Matt O'Neill. So without further ado, please give a warm remote welcome to our first speaker, Dick Sloan. Well, hello, and I'm happy to be here today, um, be able to ex provide some experience of where I'm coming from and why I got interested in this neonicotinoid seed treatments. Um, if I stumble on the words, well, I'm a farmer after all. So, uh, but really, I started out as a biology student. Uh, I was interested in biology in high school, um, studied it, stayed with a biology degree when I was at, at Iowa State University. And then when I went off to Cleveland, Ohio, and, and proved to myself that, yes, I could handle graduate school, I really had to think about what did I want to do? And since my siblings weren't interested in farming, I'd grown up on a farm, I decided that was a good time for me to leave graduate school and come back and be a farmer. And so that was 1978 was the first year that I started farming. Um, we grew the farm together um, my, with my dad. We had two years of corn and a year of soybeans in our rotation. Um, and I, would, I had gradually developed uh, to the point where I was no-tilling the corn into the soybean ground and, and soybeans into the corn ground. But then I would till and apply fertilizers and hog manure, I raised pigs as a value-added crop. That was how I kept myself busy and made it work as a young farmer. Um, but I was always uh, recognized well by the county soil conservation. Uh, I, my brother and I earned an award uh, early on in our careers, we put in terraces, we did contour farming. I was always cognizant of the soil testing to know what nutrients I should provide and not over apply. Um, and we always kept our waterways in good shape. Uh, but in two, by 2006, I had decided that I uh, didn't need to be the hog farmer anymore. I had a younger farmer friend that was interested in renting my buildings. And so I took the opportunity to step back from being quite so busy with the pigs. And that's when I got interested in uh, a watershed group that was started. And we uh, learned about uh, paying for performance on our fields. Uh, it was kind of a working lands program where every field we'd analyze the potential for soil loss. Um, learned a lot about something called the soil conditioning index, which is a measure of uh, whether or not you're increasing the carbon in the ground or losing carbon from the ground. Um, in the watershed group, I learned to, about water conference down at Iowa State University and went down to water conference and listened to one of the professors talking about uh, soil loss. The I, soil losses for farm programs are the, if you stay under five ton an acre on soil loss, then the soil is supposed to be able to regenerate at that level. And so it would be a sustainable uh, practice to keep your soil. And that keeps you available for uh, support with farm programs. But um, when you really think about it, uh, the professor was telling us, it's like, well, really a half ton an acre is a lot more uh, probably the long-term goal that we should have. And at the time, I was probably doing around two ton an acre soil loss. And I thought, boy, can I even get there? Well, the stack of dimes is a dime is about five ton an acre soil loss on an acre. You wouldn't see that soil loss on your fields. But over a lifetime of farming, of 40 years of farming, if I could cut my soil loss from five ton down to a half ton, you can tell the difference here with the stacks of dimes. And, and so that was my impetus to get more involved with the Soil and Water Conservation District, the National Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, 
do some things there. Um, I also got to, to invited down to uh, Leopold Center conference and talk about my my experience with the soil conditioning index. But that was what introduced me to the STRIPS project, and that's the scientific trials of row crops integrated with pet, uh, prairie strips. And on that pro program, um, I I was encouraged to think about the need for more diversity on the land, um, providing habitat for um, the insects and pollinators. Uh, some of that stuff we've been hearing about in the farm press, uh, loss of monarch butterflies, the loss of different pollinators, the stresses on the environment from those things. So I did decide to work with my district conservationist and put in some prairie strips on my farm in 2012. And I planted uh, four and a half acres out of a 40 acre field in three prairie strips, um, contouring where I'd already been contouring and stuff. But this photo was taken in uh, by a drone here this summer. And uh, you can see how the, the prairie fits right into my practices, the, but still keeps high productivity in the soils. Um, it's a dramatic uh, improvement in soil loss across the field. The prairie strips uh, are perpendicular to the waterways uh, so that is kind of how to think about where they fit in the field. Um, I worked with the uh, Iowa Learning Farms and Practical Farmers, uh, our partners, and so I had a field day talking about the prairie strips, and I offered the prairie strips as a place where graduate students from Ames could come up and measure the diversity of plants and, and the uh, insects. So you can see a uh, emergence trap, uh, at one point, they had uh, pit traps to catch the beetles and find out what's living out in the, in these uh, prairie strips, and, and it was it's been a really pretty good project. But the other thing that I started to do is thinking about soil health, and in soil health practices, um, the it's also a working lands program. The conservation stewardship program was what helped me. Um, find the funding to encourage me to do the right thing with my soils and, and learn to grow uh, multi-species overwintering cover crops. Uh, I added 20 acres of small grains to my 700 acre farm so that I had the grain from growing the small grains and I could use that for my cover crops. And the other thing is uh, I never till the field anymore. I, I got to the point where I didn't have and some of that's uh, improvements in the equipment that's been available over the years that I've been farming. Um, there's been a lot of, of uh, things that have made it easier to do some of these things than, than it would have been when, you know, early on in my career. So um, the after I've been growing cover crops and doing no-till and all these things for a few years, I started to see a lot greater um, diversity of the uh, different um, fungi, the beetles, the slugs and spiders that are out in my fields. Um, you can see in this that photo, the bird nest was out in my field, um, a row of fungi uh, fruiting bodies, <laughs> the, the part that we see above ground, uh, um, doing no tillage. Uh, really helps out the fungi in the soil and the diversity of plant, uh, organisms that can grow through there. Uh, I saw the bird's nest and it's like, yes, birds eat bugs. That's how, you know, so we're, we're improving things that we do see by things that we don't see, <laughs> by improving the conditions for things we don't see sometimes. So um, I even found uh, some slugs um, once in a while out in my uh, field, um, the fungi help break down some of the residues that, that wouldn't break down as easily um, without tillage, but um, providing the habitat, why well, it's, it's all good. <laughs> so, um, I guess I, I, this idea that I'm seeing more, um, more bugs and more creatures living in my soil, actually that's the soil health aspect, you know, is try to improve the amount of life in the soil. Um, I was also becoming more aware of how 
possible to possible detrimental impacts impacts of all the Cutman farming practices that are still out there. Um, so while there are good reasons to use different products to control insects and, and problem pests in the field, uh, I use integrated pest management where you, you don't just blanket apply it across all your farm, try to focus on what's needed and when it's needed, those sorts of things. Um, one of the things, the challenge of getting to, to grow cover crops and to have uh, small grains, and it's like I've, I've lost the knowledge base that had been there, you know, 40, 50 years ago with some of these things. So I joined the Practical Farmers of Iowa. A lot of the guys that are my fellow farmers there were able to help me understand how to get these seeds in the ground at the right time, um, different types of tools. And it, it was such a friendly and helpful community that I, you know, joined and became a lifetime member and, and kept wanting to give back. So I joined the uh, cooperators group. So we were in uh, horticulture, um, livestock, row crops, the different kinds of farmers that can come together and, and do research on their farm and try and share that research and find out how some of these practices work for us and stuff. So, um, so every December we get together and have a cooperators conference and we get a lot of good tips from Haley and Stefan about how to do good research uh, the need for more than three replications, randomize the replications, all these kind of details to help us do a better job of getting good research done. And uh, so at one of these meetings, why well, here's Matt O'Neill came in fall, in December of 2013, and he talked to us about uh, his concerns with neonicotinoid seed treatments. Well, most corn seed is treated with neonicotinoids. Um, soybean seed generally comes what they call naked or untreated, and then is treated as, as a last step as it leaves the uh, salesman's facility and goes out to the farm. Then you can pick out which seed treatment you like to use on your seed. So since it was easier to get naked soybean seed to try in a pattern like we decided uh, there's three different farmers in 2014 that um, all put up plots and compared naked seed with the treated seed. And we all came back with the results that um, it really didn't show any economic benefit for our farms to grow the neonicotinoid treated soybean seeds. So since that time, uh, I did repeat the research in 2015. If you go to Practical Farmers website and you hover your mouse over the programs area, then a menu pops down and you can click on farmer led research or Haley has a nice link available that you can just use that short link to get to the research uh, stuff that Practical Farmers do. And then from there, you can search by year or you can narrow to, if you wanna look at field crops or horticulture or livestock, um, you can type in things to, to try and find out what kind of uh, thing that you're interested in and see what we've been able to learn together across the state of Iowa. So um, as a- Dick, there's a quick question in the chat from Wayne Fredericks. He's asking if there was no fungicides as well on those. Um, I, 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 you'd have to look at my research from 14 and 15 and, um, I can't remember whether I had a fungicide on those seeds and we, the three of us that did it in 2014 may have had different products that we used, but, um, there are several different products that are in the class of neonicotinoid seed, seed treatments and uh, in 20. 20 when I did my most recent research because I decided well it had been a few years I've been planting naked seed I've had my practices going but I thought let me do this research over again uh, in that in this last year then what I did is to use both uh, 
fungicide and insecticide treatments on the seed, or as the alternative, the, the, what my standard is, is to use plant naked soybean seed. So uh, I guess the, the field that I did it on this last year was an 80 acre field, and I was able to do six replications across the plot. Uh, I have a 15 foot um, drill and a 25 foot soybean head for harvesting. So if I planted three passes with my drill, I'd have a 45 foot plot, and then I could harvest the middles and then still have be able to harvest uh, the rest of the plot afterwards. Um, this view shows my tractor looking out forward, but you can see um, how many pounds of grain is still in the drill. <laughs> you can see in the monitor, the blue and the red. And so what I did is to plant um, the, the blue is the untreated seed and then the red is the treated seed. And so as I go across, I can keep track of where I was at in the field and, and let the GPS steer my tractor and, and then I could come back. But I, the other thing you need to remember when you're doing this is that, well, when I come out to do stand counts and things like that, uh, how am I gonna find them? So it's kind of a, you have to put flags in the ground too and to help keep track of where you're at um, on these fields. The yeah, other part about this field was that the east half had been in um, corn for two years before I planted soybeans. And then the west half had been a rye crop and then a corn crop. Well, rye followed by um, clover, red clover, and then planted to corn. So while the whole field had been corn the previous year, the two different halves had had a different rotation. And I thought, well, we'd split the field. So there's two 40 acre fields when I harvested it. And that way I could compare, did I get a benefit dependent on my soil, my crop rotation? I might've got a different result on the one half than the other because of the crop rotation. So um, this is be a picture when the soybeans are up and the rye is dying. You can see how big everything got before I, I, let, I plant my soybeans green and I actually plant, harvest uh, or I, I spray the uh, rye and trid kale and it's a three-way mix usually that I plant ahead of soybeans. Um, I killed that off after the beans are up out of the ground. Um, you have to work with your crop insurance agent and, and decide what works for you. Uh, this has been a practice I've done for a number of years, and, and you, but you have to communicate with your um, agents and make sure that they're going to agree to it. But you can see how the there's a lot of residue on the ground. There's still dying rot or dead rye, but it's still standing. I don't roll it down or anything. Um, so I ended up, uh, the fields are nice and clean. Um, no hard to find your way around out there. I did leave a little gap. Uh, what I did is I uh, had a gap between each uh, plot so that I could kind of find myself in the field. Uh, that was just a little tricky spot. But, um, basically, I harvested everything and with six replications on each half of 80 acre field, both rotations, I just saw no benefit to um, the expense of the soybean seed treatment. So I'm going to continue my practice to uh, not use seed treatments. This is one of my favorite photos that I took and I was so excited to uh, catch a bee out here on my purple prairie clover <laughs> that was in my uh, prairie strip. And I sent the photo off to Megan that was the graduate student that was studying bees and, and told me about how I had 29 different species of bees out there in the field. And she said, yeah, that's, that's a really nice fly. <laughs> it's not even a bee, but it's still an important pollinator. So <laughs> that was a, oh, there you go. <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> so with that, I'd like to hand it off to Matt, unless there's some questions that we want to uh, review at this time, Haley. Yeah, I think if, 
Well, I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment. Um, so let's go ahead and hand it over to Matt and then we'll get to Q&A at the end. Great. Thank you, Dick. That was great, Dick. Can you, um, can you guys hear me okay as I turn my mic on and get going? Um, I, that, uh, it was all I could do to keep from jumping in and uh, when you were telling the story about that last picture to say, that's not a bee, that's not a bee. And then the punchline was, it's a fly. Um, yeah, that's a, a, a surfid fly. Sorry, it's the entomologist in me that has to point these things out. And surfids are uh, beneficial in two ways. They visit flowers and they can be a, a pollinator, but the larvae are uh, predaceous. The maggots are predaceous and the adult flies will lay their eggs on plants where there's a lot of food for the larvae to feed on because they can't get very far. Um, and uh, yeah, they can be a significant source of mortality for soft bodied insects that feed on crops. Oh, I don't know, like the soybean aphid. So that's my segue to begin sharing. And I was uh, going to share some slides uh, with uh, you all to kind of build on what uh, Dick had uh, shared with us. And I want to talk a little bit big picture um, about maybe why we're using uh, insecticides at all in um, crops like soybeans, and then um, talk a bit about the, uh, the research that's been done uh, at multiple locations, institutions, including Iowa State, um, that, um, oh shoot, sorry guys, uh, multiple institutions that back up uh, some of what uh, Dick has shared with uh, you um, and get at some of the both agronomic but also the environmental impacts of using this type of tool. And Haley, give me a sign if I get too wordy and uh, jump in with questions. I can't see the chat box anymore now that I've got my slides up. So um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a, an entomologist with a research teaching position here at Iowa State University. Um, I was a graduate student through the 90s and uh, was interested in insect pests of crops like corn and soybeans. But uh, in the early 90s to mid 90s, there weren't a lot of insect pests that that are were a problem for soybean farmers. Uh, spider mites that occasionally build up in large numbers, and this is an image of a, a healthy population of spider mites. Um, bean leaf beetles can be a, a problem, and there was a period in uh, the 90s when Iowa and Minnesota suffered from some outbreaks, and they still pop up, but they're not the perennial pests that attack crops like corn uh, when we think of things like corn rootworms. And the USDA estimated in 96 that no insecticides were used in the major uh, soybean producing regions of the Midwest. That was before 2000. After 2000, uh, this little critter arrived, the soybean aphid. And uh, by 2003, it had spread across the state of Iowa. Um, in 2004, I was hired as the soybean entomologist at Iowa State, and I began uh, researching uh, ways to manage this pest. So this little aphid can build large populations throughout the summer. Um, they typically are on the underside of the leaf, but uh, the impact of the feeding and the honeydew that they produce uh, sheds down on the uh, top of leaves below them, and this mold shows up. And that's how you know when you've got a really bad problem. Uh, you don't see the aphids on the top of the leaf, but underneath, in an outbreak, you can have hundreds of thousands of aphids. And because of these outbreaks, insecticide use increased in soybeans since the arrival of the aphid. A lot of this early on was foliar applications of insecticide, uh, typically by airplane, though ground rigs uh, part of that. And that has resulted in a dramatic change in how we grow soybeans, at least for the major soybean growing regions of the United States, like Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois. Um, a group of toxicologists around the time that, uh, Dick, you were doing your work exploring how neonics, uh, they were looking at the changes in environmental impacts of the major crops in the US. And in this series of figures, they show how a variety of indices for measuring environmental impacts changed over a decade from about 2000 to 2010. And 
I don't want to go into details about all of the lines. You can look up this article to understand what each of these indices are, but I want you to see the pattern here and note um, from that uh, uh, kids program, you know, one of these things is not like the other, right? So corn, cotton, wheat, the indices are all trending down or flat, but soybean is the one that's not like the other. That line, uh, that red line, FET, freshwater ecotoxicity, is going up over that decade. And these toxicologists note that over that decade, as a result of the soybean aphids invasion of the U.S., the total quantity of insecticides applied to soybeans quadrupled. So this is worrisome, right? It's worrisome both environmentally because these pesticides, as Dick pointed out, they don't just stay in your field. They move. Uh, and it's worrisome for the farmers because, uh, you know, farmers don't want to do environmental uh, damage, but they've got to grow a crop. And this new pest was challenging many farmers in a way that they hadn't been challenged before. So along comes uh, neonicotinoids. They weren't invented for uh, soybean aphids, but they uh, were um, produced uh, and became commercially available around the time that the soybean aphid had arrived in North America. And over about now, oh geez, uh, a 20 year period, a lot of work has been done uh, to, to understand how effective a tool they are. And uh, Haley, I believe all of these articles that I'm gonna go through are available to the audience um, as a, a public access. You can download these. I'm not going to go into great deal about any one of them, but I'm going to bring up some highlights. So the first one I want to talk about is the paper that was done uh, by a graduate student of mine here at Iowa State, Probability of Cost-Effective Management of the Soybean Aphid in North America. Um, this predates some of Dick's work, but uh, there's some similarities in the findings. Uh, another study that I want to talk about was by a group of agronomists, uh, titled High Input Management Systems Effect on Soybean Seed Yield, Yield Components, and Economic Break-Even Probabilities. And these guys, and they were mostly guys, uh, studied how using inputs individually or co in combination can improve uh, soybean yield. And they talk about seed treatments. So the, then the next one is more recent, it's 2020. The Iowa State University Report of Insecticide. Uh, this is done by my colleague Erin Hodgson, and she publishes this every year. And it's uh, an update on how well these products are working. And I'll talk a little bit about the information that's available there. And finally, if there's time, um, another paper that came out this year uh, by Christian Krupke and John Tooker titled Beyond the Headlines, The Influence of Insurance Pest Management on an Unseen Silent Entomological Majority. And this is uh, a really thoughtfully written uh, review of a lot of the work that has been done on seed treatments, both in terms of their agronomic uh, value, but also the, the environmental impact that they can have. So I'm going to bring up in the next, oh, I don't know, do I have about 15 minutes uh, or so? Uh, I want to... Yeah, uh, 15 minutes is good. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to keep there, but I'm going to bring up some highlights from these four studies. Um, so the work that was done here at Iowa State um, involved a comparison of four methods for managing the soybean aphid that we did in three states over three years. And the four methods were untreated control, do nothing, a prophylactic approach where an insecticide and fungicide was applied to the foliage when the soybeans flowered, whether the pests were there or not, a seed treatment Cruise, in this case, it was Cruiser, uh, the active ingredient is thiamethoxam. And then the final one, which is what I think, Dick, you talked about using is IPM, scouting the fields and applying an insecticide as needed. And the paper goes on to explain how well those, uh, those treatments of, uh, manage the soybean aphid and protect the plants from the aphid. But the biggest one uh, result that I, I, that I was kind of most proud of was estimating the gain threshold. Gain threshold is something that entomologists use. Um, it's basically the break-even point. It's the point at which what you, um, what you paid for in insecticide, did it cover the cost uh, um, of itself when it came time to harvest? 
Did you protect enough yield for at least you to pay for the insecticide? Gain threshold, break even. And we reported this as a probability based on the price of soybeans through a range of prices from six to $12 per bushel. And we broke down our treatments, IPM, where the farmer just goes out and scouts or he pays somebody to scout. And then we looked at our prophylactic and our seed treatment. So prophylactic, we're spraying every year. Seed treatment, we're using it every year. You have to make that decision you know, before the pests arrive. So these are treatments where whether the insect was there or not, we treated. IPM, we treated if the aphid was there in a meaningful enough level. And I want you to uh, look at the values here. Note that for IPM, the probability of reaching the break-even point, which is what these values are, is 69% or higher. Whereas for our prophylactic and seed treatment, um, sometimes it reaches above 50, but it's always lower than an IPM approach. So if you burn a few more calories, if you go out and scout and you use the products as needed, our research suggested, yeah, you're probably going to get your money back across a three-state, three-year experiment. And that was very focused on the soybean aphid, right? It wasn't, we didn't look at other pests. We were just focused on what's the best way to manage the soybean aphid? Well, Building on some of that work was a group of agronomists who looked at a variety of management tactics, not just pests, but fertilizer, weeds, fungicides. And they published this study in 2016, a little bit more ambitious than what we did. We did three states uh, in ours, Iowa, Minnesota, and Michigan. These guys did, what, nine states across a variety of regions. And they looked at more than just insecticides. Uh, insect, uh, pesticides were there, fungicide seed treatments, a fungicide plus insecticide seed treatment, uh, defoliants, nitrogen, uh, foliar fertilization, uh, foliar applications, not just seed treatments as listed here, but foliar applications. And all of these are the experiments uh, that they did with just those treatments alone compared to an uncontrolled, or I'm sorry, a controlled plot where they didn't do anything. And then they had these, what they called soya treatments, where they started doing combinations of those individual inputs that are listed above. And they estimated the cost for these. So, you know, the individual cost for a fungicide seed treatment is about, uh, they estimate $21 per hectare, but their soya, where they combined everything, well, now the inputs are costing $341 per hectare. So now the question is, okay, where do these fall in terms of a break even? Where do you break even with using individual versus all the inputs or a subset of the inputs combined? Right, this is a, a massive study. These guys and gals did a great job. Um, and one of the things that they, they show is um, these break even values or percentages again, probability of break even here. Can you all see that? And they break them down by the different inputs individually and then the combos down below. I'm just gonna draw your attention to some that are relevant for our discussion today. Here's the foliar insecticide alone and the foliar fungicide insecticide combined. And note that as the value of the crop goes up, the probability of a break-even point increases. So at the most valuable uh, 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 price for soybeans, you get into the uh, 78 to 90% chance of breaking even. Right. These are for foliar applied insecticides. Right? And I got to point out, they didn't scout. They just applied them, I think it was the first week of August. Seed treatments. Right. Note the values here for the probabilities of breaking even. The highest they get is 29 for the highest value of the crop. Notice some zeros here. All right. So this is, uh, I think, uh, supportive of what Dick's research showed for his farm, that the chance of breaking even with the seed treatment use is kind of small to none, right? Uh, if you compared it to using an insecticide, a foliar applied insecticide, and uh, foliar applied insecticide, better bet there, right? And that's not even with scouting. And, they, and the authors note there were times where they sprayed with, they didn't need to, but that wasn't part of their experimental design. Okay, so 
that was work done in, in 2016. Things change, people change. Uh, where are we at now? Well, Dr. Aaron Hodson, our soybean and corn field crop extension entomologist at Iowa State, has been doing uh, an insecticide evaluation yearly um, for many years. To, if I can get a little plug, I started this uh, for aphids back when I came, and then Aaron took it over when she came, uh, and she's built on it. Uh, it's the largest insecticide evaluation program for soybeans, I think, in uh, in the region, if not the nation. And she looks at soybean aphids and Japanese beetles and soybean gall midge. You can find, oh, I'm sorry. You can find this for free at the IOSU uh, website. And she produces a new one every year. She'll show you all the products that she tests. So here's Cruiser that was tested in 2020. These are seed treatments. And she looks at those alone. And then she looks at the seed treatment and foliar applications of insecticides on top of them. So both of these combine, and there's a variety of insecticides, foliar applied insecticides that she uses. She tells us the timing of when that was, the foliar was applied. Note that for the seed treatment, there's no timing here, it's just at planting. And uh, I think, Dick, maybe you made mention of this. There's different rates of these seed treatments. Uh, you can get a, a low rate and a rate that's twice that. Um, and she looks at all of these. So I'll give you a little hint of what she found this year. Uh, populations were pretty low for the soybean aphids, uh, well below our economic threshold of 250 aphids, but she doesn't let that stop her. She continues to uh, spray these to see just how well they're working because resistance can occur and we're starting to see that for some active ingredients. And then she shows us the yield. Um, and in 2020, I think this is pretty consistent with what you saw, Dick. Here's the untreated control, and here's cruiser. And these letters here indicate whether there's a statistical significance. If the letters are shared amongst these treatments, they're the same statistically. Numerically, cruiser was a little bit lower, but statistically the same as our untreated control. In fact, a lot of these were all the same. So this year, soybean aphids, at least at the one location that she studied, not a big factor. Right? So if you were scouting, you probably wouldn't have uh, sprayed here um, and you wouldn't have needed to spend that money based on what she found. So this changes, uh, I shouldn't say changes. Um, she does the same experiment every year. She uses some of the same products. She reports the same data. And if you get to a point where you need to use a pesticide against an insect in soybeans, this is a good research to help you make an informed decision. Okay, so there are times where we're going to have to use insecticides if we want to make optimal yield. Um, there are other times where we could probably pump the brakes and ease off, right? Uh, going beyond the decisions we make on a farm, uh, we want to think about the, the impact of those decisions for the broader environment. And this article that I mentioned a little bit ago uh, by Krupke and Tooker is a nice review of what is known about the potential impacts for using uh, a seed treatment. And for the sake of time, I'm just gonna draw your attention to this figure um, that summarizes how the decision to use a seed treatment um, can affect the surrounding environment in terms of the movement of that uh, neonicotinoid off of the treated seed into the surrounding environment. So they note that uh, there's protection below ground and above ground, but only a subset of that product is taken up by the plant. Some of it is lost due to dust at planting, and there are ways to limit this, but it still happens. Uh, and then some of it is lost through the soil, movement through the soil into um, the, the, uh, the larger environment, both into the field edges where we might have flowering plants that can take up those products, or it continues to move into the watershed uh, where it is in the water and then absorbed by plants and then possibly fed on by other insects in those environments. So one thing that we're doing at Iowa State, and I'll, I'll end with this, is uh, looking at how neonics might accumulate within prairie strips. Prairie strips is a practice that uh, Dick has participated in. It's now a um, a sea, uh, conservation reserve program sponsored uh, activity. And we've shown in a, a variety of ways 
the uh, value of this for improving biodiversity. It does. It increases the diversity of insects, specifically beneficial insects and pollinators. So we now want to know, as we put these prairie strips out in the uh, landscape, in the farm, uh, do the neonics move down into them and are they taken up by the plant? So over the last three years, we've been measuring in the soil of these prairie strips on the uh, top end, whether there's clothionidin, imidacloprid, and thiomethoxin. And then we look not only in the soil, but in the leaf tissue of flowering plants for those products. And here is Maura Hall, the toxicology PhD student who's leading this work, doing the, the actual day-to-day uh, -day work. And she's what I call bee fishing. She's sucking the with a vacuum cleaner the bees that are visiting the flowers in these strips, looking to see if the neonics are in the nectar and the pollen that the bee has just collected. Uh, this is uh, work that we're wrapping up and we're about to publish. And if you want to know more about what we found, I can take some questions and uh, share those articles as they come out later. All right, that's what I wanted to share. I hope I didn't take up too much time. Thank you very much, Matt. I think we're doing good on time. We have until 1210. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and take some questions for both Matt and Rick and Dick. You can um, enter those in the chat. I see we have a couple already. Um, and Dick and Matt chime in whenever it is relevant for you. Um, but let's see, uh, Rob Voss made a comment in the chat. Um, I think this was when Matt was comparing foliar versus seed treatment uh, insecticides maybe. Um, he said planting dates come into the mix as well as peace of mind for doing the best job protecting the profitability. If your house didn't burn last year, you threw that protection premium away as well. Does either of you have any comments on that? I just wanna make sure I understand the question. Um, is I think he's asking, does um, planting date uh, affect the efficacy of a seed treatment? And if that's the question, um, it's, a, it's a very good one. Um, and it's, it's a little bit complicated because planting date can affect whether the crop is gonna be attacked by certain pests. Earlier planting dates often put soybeans at risk for bean leaf beetles. The later you plant, the less likely you are to have a bean leaf beetle problem. Um, so that's one complication. Um, for the planting date and its interaction with the efficacy of the seed treatment, um, pretty much regardless of the planting date, uh, seed treatments activity in the plant and its ability to protect against something like soybean aphids is limited to about a two to three week window. So after that three week window, um, there is very little, if any, neonicotinoid, neonicotinoid in the plant. So um, a couple of things to think about is, okay, when are you planting? Does that planting put you at risk for certain pests? And how long do you need that protection? And two to three weeks is pretty much the limit. And it's not like it's on and then after three weeks it's off. It's more of a, it peaks and then it kind of comes down. Um, without knowing the specifics of an individual farm, it, it's a little bit hard for me to, you know, make a more specific recommendation. What, what do you think, Dick? Has that been an issue for you? Uh, I think it is one of the things that you farmers think about a lot of times when they're considering a fungicide if you're going to plant your soybeans in the middle of April and you realize that there's a pretty good potential for that ground being cold, there's maybe more potential for a fungicide to um, pay for itself. Uh, I haven't done research. I don't know of any other practical farmers that have done research on that, trying to co compare the two. Um, but one of the things that I, you know, on my farm, I, I am using, um, cover crops and I'm planting green when I'm planting soybeans. And the, uh, I know like in the case, uh, we saw slugs on my farm, but they've never been a problem for me. Uh, planting earlier on soybeans generally, because there are areas of the country where slugs are a problem for, for soybeans. They, they cut the plants, kill the plants off, you know, so the, the, plat the fact that there's rye out there, that's also a place, 
the the slugs might decide, oh, I'm going to eat on this rye plant instead of the soybean plant. Um, planting earlier, the slugs aren't as big. Uh, there's things like that that come into play, that's for sure. Uh, I guess I wondered too if, uh, well, your studies have been a lot about aphids and that's a later season problem, the, the, the soybean bean leaf beetle. Um, I know there's some some concern about that at times with uh, soybeans and early planting, and, and I don't know whether there's specifically any seed treatment benefit from the insecticides there. Yeah, um, quite a bit of work was done um, in the early 2000s, and I overlapped a bit with Jeff Bradshaw and um, uh, Marlon Rice, uh, who led that work. Um, with bean leaf beetles, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, there is evidence that the bean, that the seed treatments protect the plant from bean leaf beetles in their o the overwintering generation that's coming out in the spring, and a little bit into that first generation that you know, emerges from their offspring. Um, so there there can be some protection, um, and it's that's uh, significant uh, when it comes to things like the defoliation that those generations would do. The one thing that uh, their work showed was that it didn't, there was no evidence that the seed treatment was interfering with the bean leaf beetles transmitting bead pod model virus. Okay. So um, that's a trickier thing. Um, and it's uh, one where uh, I think they concluded that, yeah, if you, if you consistently see bean leaf beetles and you've got evidence that they're going to uh, show up and cause defoliation, yeah, seed treatment could be a good option for you, but for preventing bean pod model virus, uh, that's a little bit trickier issue. And I, th I think that's one for uh, a plant pathologist and a breeder to tackle. And because interrupting disease uh, transmission is really hard with insecticides. Okay, because that's a lot of times the idea is to be concerned about the bean leaf beetle because a little bit of defoliation, the bean plant generally can recover and doesn't really have a long term, but that potential for the, the virus and the transmission of that is maybe more of an economic concern. It would devalue your crop at harvest, um, even though you grow the beans, if they're worth less because of the in, impacts of the quality of the seed that's there, so. Great. Uh... Can you respond to Tom Lawler's question? He's asking if Aaron Hodson has compiled the data into a multi-year analysis to see if there's any um, statistically significant impact of these products versus the control on profitability and yield across years. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think she has periodically. Um, uh, you might reach out to her. I think she did one a couple of years ago. Um, and we recently published a paper where we looked at that um, that question about the profitability for spraying foliar insecticide uh, in a um, preventative versus a IPM basis. So this is a little bit different question than what uh, uh, I think it was you said Tom asked. So. In that paper, in that study, we did not look at seed treatments because it's pretty clear that seed treatments are not an optimal way of managing soybean aphids. And unless you know in advance that you need it for say something like bean leaf beetles, uh, it's probably not gonna give you much of a payoff. However, for uh, making a decision about a foliar insecticide, a lot of farmers were hearing tank mix their fungicide application with some insecticide. Um, and that's still preventative, you know, or prophylactic. They haven't scouted for the aphid, but that fungicide has to go on in a, in a more time sensitive manner. And given that the insecticides are pretty cheap, the decision is, hey, I'll go ahead, tank mix, put them both in and see what you get. Uh, and there's some benefit to those. It's a little bit hard to separate out the whether it's from the fungicide and the insecticide. Anyway, to make this long story short, we summarized that data and that, uh, and then looked at how often that decision paid off. Um, to make a long story short, yeah, you know, the tank mix did provide some protection, um, but the IPM approach typically did a better job. Um, and I can uh, share that with you all. Um, 
after the conference if you want to put it someplace where everybody could see it. Uh, can I comment too? Um, when I'm with soybeans, are a lot more able to lose, you know, 10, 15 percent of, of the crop. You know, if you've got them planted thick enough, they don't have to be highly uniform like corn does. They they can they are able to compensate. They they bush more. They branch more. You know, as a crop, they're more resilient to uh, some of these impacts that that the seed treatment might be. Uh, that and I think that's why it's so common for corn seed treatment being a much more fragile crop, being more dependent on uniformity uh, to, to do well, to yield the best that it can. So uh, that's, you know, that's an impact on just the crop difference. The other thing I wanted to bring up is uh, Clark McGrath had done a, a good job with a Wallace's Farmer article that I saw and I think it was November. And I think uh, Haley has the link for, for people to be able to look at that. And it's called Soybean Seed Treatments. How much protection do we need? Um, it's a, there's a lot of products out there. Uh, there's a link in that article, and, and I think we have it also available to uh, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin publication, What's on Your Seed? And it helps people understand looking at the tag on, on their products, the seeds that they're planting, and trying to decide what's really even on there. Is it at the 1x rate or the 5x rate? You can kind of see some of that stuff and the impacts that it has on the Thanks. So. All right, uh, let's take one more question from Wayne Fredericks. Um, he's asking if planting green into cereal rye affects the seed treatment decision. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, uh, so planting uh, uh, and cover crops, uh, I think there's sort of two general strategies. Um, the brown and down versus uh, planting into it, the planting into green. And um, I, my, this is a broader question than seed treatments, but one concern that uh, I have about cover crops is uh, what, what does that do for your pest management issues? Uh, there's some concern that cover crops can act as a green bridge for certain pests. Um, they might be attractive to moths that are migrating up. And there's been some reports that uh, a cover crop could lead to uh, defoliation by things like cutworm and armyworm um, in ways that a plant that was, that was sown into just bare field doesn't have to worry about. So um, a couple things to think about there is, uh, and I think Dick, you just mentioned this a moment ago, look at the label. You know, what, what is it that you're worried about and is that pest on the label for neonics? Uh, some LEPs can be uh, managed with a neonic, but others not so much. And that includes things like armyworm and cutworm. Um, so double check, make sure if, if you're planting into green and um, you, you're, you think you might have a, a risk of some migrating pests, uh, double check to see if the label would provide you protection from that pest, because not all of them will. And there's some variation amongst the more uh, established neonicotinoids and uh, some of the newer ones that are coming onto the market. I've I've seen uh, the armyworm be a problem one year out of eight that I've had green cover crops when I'm planting corn. I've never had the same problem with soybeans. Um, somehow I feel like the soybean being a legume planted into what I have for cover crops is mostly grasses uh, that it just uh, doesn't see the any allelopathy and and soybeans being resilient the way they are. I just I just feel like that I might lose a percentage of my plants. Um, generally it's better for me to just plant plenty of seed and not treat the seed, if you're going to cut, that's one of the things uh, Clark brought up in his article and, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, idea that, well, what are you going to, or how thick are you going to plant these crops? It, it matters in your decision and plays into it. So. 
All right. Well, I better hey, wrap Haley, things up. Haley, before. can I make one plug? One quick plug. Um, so uh, this has been kind of a downer session, right? Uh, but one one positive thing, uh, if I could just plug at the end, aphid resistant soybeans. This is something that USDA and ISU and others have developed. We've tested them and they repeatedly show great efficacy for preventing soybean aphid outbreaks. And if, if aphid is a problem for you, uh, maybe consider soybean aphid resistant varieties instead of a seed treatment. And I'll leave it at okay. that. <laughs> Great. Well, I think we might be booted off here. So thank you both of you so much for speaking. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, check out Sam Bennett's comment in the chat there about a trial that he's going to be conducting. Um, if you're interested in joining on that.